I'm a computational designer. I use harnessing power of computers to generate complex designs. But at the same time, I constantly search for ways in which computers can be used in more human ways. To illustrate the idea, I would like to look into Albert Durer's engraving from 1514. This is a pretty striking engraving as Albert Durer depicts himself as an angel who is sitting among the tools of computation, indifferent to all of them. Remember, this is the pinnacle of Renaissance. And Albert Durer is one of the most sophisticated artists of all times. Why would he depict himself as an angel who is just sitting and not doing anything although he or she has all these tools for computation and measurement around himself. To dig into this question, I would like to ask three other questions. And the first one is, is this a duck or a rabbit? Depending on the orientation of the picture, our perception and cognition work hand to hand to help us find the answer. So we can pick one or the other. But if we really push the strength of our perception, we can come up with some other solutions. In this case, I would like to see a crocodile in here. And I can extend this solution to other visions that I can come up with. This is the power of perception, and this is the power of design ideation. It's very, very important for me because this is how I come up with original new ideas and design the new version of something that has been done before. So I have to really push and go beyond the duck and rabbit to come up with a new idea. The second question that I would like to ask, again, remember to answer why Durer is sitting indifferent to all these tools, is, is the point inside or outside the closed curve? This is, again, a binary question. And a human can answer this question just by looking at the image. If you look at the two diagrams at the top, you'd see that point is either inside or it's outside. You can immediately tell that. If I want to write this as an instruction so a computer can solve this problem for me, I would need to shoot some rays from those points and count the number of intersections. If the number of intersections is odd, then the point is inside. If the number of intersections is even, then the point is outside. So that would be my solution. But interestingly, what happens here is that the problem of seeing, the problem of perception immediately becomes a problem of counting. Whatever we can define in the computer realm doesn't necessarily capture everything we can do with our perception. In this respect, it's somehow hard to put the words design and computation together. And it's very important for me to put these things together because I'm a computational designer. So how do I really do that? The answer comes through applications, ideations, and research. Today, many disciplines benefit from the power of design and computation. For instance, in the field of architecture, you can realize the buildings that were never done before. So in this case, in this building, I'm using a generative design tool to create a sophisticated form, while at the same time using the parametric design engine to resolve the complexities of the structure. In the numbers and colors, I'm depicting the torsion that needs to go into each and every beam on the building for it to be realized. We don't necessarily have to use computational design tools for sole reason of making designs. We can also use it for ideation and exploration. In this case, I'm using a set of synthetic images that are created through a machine learning algorithm using the photographs of my paintings. I'm applying bitmap processing to each and every synthetic image to generate the 3D form. I'm using the colors from the synthetic image to be applied to the 3D mesh. And I'm also applying some sort of strata to give the form a building-like look. So this is maybe bringing out the architect in me, but at the same time, I'm finding a way to merge my oil paintings through machine learning to an architectural idea. And as another example, design and computation can also be applied in the realm of product design. Here, we are looking into a performance running shoe. 
In the realm of shoe design, computers are not only enabling us to collect a lot of data so we can customize products according to them, but at the same time, they are empowering us to come up with some new forms that has minuscule structures in them to be realized through emergent manufacturing techniques, such as 3D printing. Design and computation is enabling us to transcend across the disciplines. So we can somehow, using similar ideas, move from the giant scale of architectural artifacts, the buildings, to the abstract world of paintings and to the minuscule structures that become alive in a product design. But if we go back, if we step back, we realize that in the center of all these efforts, there's a human being who tries to put these ideas, who tries to use these tools to achieve something greater than that was done before. This should ideally help us realize that no matter how advanced the design tools are, how advanced the computational techniques are, the human intention, human perception, and human ideation remain central to the design processes and to the processes of making. Realizing this should also make us go back to our design tools and revise them. Again, in the realm of architecture, we can keep being fascinated with automation tools. For instance, here, we came up with a facade generation tool and we made sure that there was some sort of self-awareness component which helped this facade algorithm to avoid placing similarly shaped facade panels around the same area. Yet at the same time, no matter what we did, the end result wasn't satisfactory for the designers. This made us go back to the design tool and add some features to empower the designer to replace some portions of the design completely. This tool and this project by themselves have been the proof that no matter how intelligent the system is, we may still want to put human intention first and foremost. And this brings me to the realm of art again. Can we make computational art more humanized? Somehow, yes. Oil painting is a great outlet for me. And these are the photographs of probably my fascination of whatever emerges while painting. When I started looking into machine learning tools, I was really curious to see what would emerge if I fed all of these images into a machine learning algorithm and train a model with them. And these are the outcomes from that study. It's pretty interesting in the way that the algorithm somehow captures some of the patterns and colors from the paintings. I find these paintings interesting and I accept them as the extension of whatever I am doing with the oil paintings themselves. Yet at the same time, I also feel that they are missing some sort of touch and some sort of striking moment that I had in the original paintings. Then I happened to ask if it would be possible to use power of computing to generate patterns while retaining the human's embodied processes in the painting process. I built this painting system, which enabled the painters to use their own traces, colors, and blots as bits of computing. So in this example, you can draw a curve and you can use it to make a pattern. And then you project that pattern underneath your painting to move forward in the painting process. But at an unexpected moment, a red circle appears and then another one and then another one. And then some red lines appear as well. This is very interesting because, again, this is the human perception and intention that puts something onto the canvas that is not necessarily existent in the pattern that is generated by the computer. And in this painting specifically, the black traces and the watercolor blots are somehow the ducks and the rabbits that existed before. Whereas the red lines and red circles are the crocodiles that happen to appear because you want to put them there and because you want to see them. And as we discussed, the influence of data collection and computation keeps increasing in the realm of footwear design. And data, no matter what we do, 
remains incomplete. And with our perceptions and intentions, while using those numbers and colors, we always end up looking into a portion of the problem. In a way, this can help us understand that the problems are always larger than we can handle. We split the world into parts, and then we put those parts together to make new holes. But the parts really exist for the purpose of analysis and nothing else. While describing our limbs, we can claim that we have fingers, hands, and arms. But if somebody asks where one starts and where the other one ends, it would be impossible for us to draw a very clear line between our fingers and our hands. This brings me to the third and final question that I ask to understand Albert Dürer. And if we circle back to this engraving, probably we can have a better understanding now. Remember the three questions. Is it a duck or a rabbit? Is the point inside or outside the closed curve? Is it a part or a whole? So what Albert Dürer is dealing in his mind are his very human questions. He is sitting among the tools of design, computation, and measurement because these tools are only secondary to everything else that he is trying to do. The primary thing that he is trying to do is creating meaning and value. The primary thing that he's trying to do is depicting himself inside out. It turns out that Albert Dürer said, what is beautiful I do not know, around the time he made this engraving. And in today's data-driven and computationally saturated world, we need to revive the critical view of Albert Dürer. And design will help us to learn how to do so.